Uh, today's topic is ArcGIS indoors integration with IoT. I'm Bernd Gruber. Uh, next to me, Pat Wallace. Next to me, Morocat. Um, like to go quickly through our agenda today. So we're going to start this introduction about ArcGIS indoors, giving you an IoT overview, um, showing you what smart workplaces are with IoT, how the integration with IoT in the platform looks like, a case study, and then basically a wrap up. With that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Pat Wallace. Thanks, Bernd. So I'm going to start with a, a quick overview. Uh, first, to show of hands, how many have been to some of the previous indoor sessions? Maybe you were there earlier this morning with me. So maybe about a third of you. So, so I need to give a quick overview so you kind of understand what we're up to. Uh, what does indoors do? Well, number, number one, it's a, it's a complete geo-enabled system, full stack, uh, ArcGIS Enterprise. You know, it's a bundled, bundled package. Uh, you can use GeoEvent if you want. There's web applications. There's connected native mobile applications. There's a ArcGIS Pro. Uh, it's not technically an add-in. Right now, it's a toolbox and a, um, like a, a custom Python environment that you set up. Uh, in the future, there'll be like wizard-like interfaces to walk you through map creation, curation, et cetera. But why are you doing that? Well, you provide this common picture of a workplace, right? Uh, insides of buildings, between buildings, how buildings are connected together um, so that you can help optimize uh, what people are doing uh, at a workplace regardless of where, where that is. Uh, a college campus, a uh, corporate campus, uh, a high rise uh, building, et cetera. Uh, what else can you do with it? Well, it allows me to see everything uh, in that context, right? No longer are buildings uh, voids of information. You can actually dive into them, see what's going on. So you can see uh, the resources that are assigned there, like fixed assets, like the buildings themselves, uh, high value equipment, uh, 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 pers personnel uh, uh, or, or mobile equipment, for example. Um, as well as uh, any activities that are happening uh, in those areas. And you know, why do people have resources? Well, they're there to support those activities, right? So this gives you complete visibility on the activities and the resources supporting those activities, whether they're inside of a building, outside of a building, uh, or, or wherever they might be. And this also, uh, this visualization uh, and, and the, the connectivity to other business systems uh, also helps with uh, supporting continuity of operations. So for example, in an environmental health safety uh, context or uh, global security operations for, for an organization. Um, so it looks like I talked about you know, some of these high level uh, value propositions. Um, I'll show you the cool uh, uh, videos that go along with it. Um, as I mentioned, it is a complete system, right? So there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, moving parts to it. Um, so we have to understand what the customer wants to do so it can set it up correctly and enable those components that will serve them best. Uh, so for example, on my team, in, uh, I'm in professional services. I lead our indoors team. A uh, number of folks on our team are here, and, and they all do different things, right? They all have different uh, uh, specialties, uh, areas that they're expert in in areas that they're becoming expert in. A GIS analyst is uh, typically not the same skill set as what I'd call a platform engineer. And a, an analyst or platform engineer is not also a uh, cartographer. If, if you find somebody that has all of those skill sets together you know, in, in one person, you're, it's, it's, it's a rarity, right? And we're lucky at Esri to, to have found uh, some of those folks. So, uh, and you probably know how hard it is to, to get those skill sets together. Um, you know, it all uh, sits on top of a data model that makes sense uh, for uh, visualizing, understanding, uh, you know, the built environment. And this is some of what it looks like. Uh, it is the only uh, product in the ArcGIS universe that I know of that deals with points of interest. Yes, things that are interesting or of interest uh, with your day-to-day -day, uh, business operations uh, that you want to find uh, out more information on. So we provide you a way to manage those things uh, as well as find those things and share views of that information with colleagues uh, and, uh, and with other business teams in your organization. 
Um, there is a web, uh, as I mentioned, the web and uh, web version looks some, something like this. There's a desktop view. It's a fully responsive application. Um, you kind of see on the left there, there's uh, you know, favorites, there's categories that you can explore, uh, there's directions uh, that show up if you publish a routing service. There's also events that show up. So like uh, things that you could go to that you might want to go to like at this, uh, at this conference, right? So you could load those into the system. Maybe you have a web API to an event system in your organization and you can just load those calendar events into indoors and you can find them because generally they're happening somewhere, right? So kind of going through this. Uh, there's a connectivity to Survey123 and the 1.0 release that's built on 10.7. At the, uh, the increment, incremental release 1.1, the mobile applications move from just supporting Survey123 uh, to, uh, you know, uh, uses HTTP uh, protocol, so you can just structure the URL to dump out to any system that has uh, smart web launch capabilities. What does that mean? That means I can suck out the smart indoor information, put it into another system, right? So indoors is a window into these other systems. So, oh, it provides branding capability. How many of you went to the uh, plenary? Right, so you saw the Exxon example and you saw it was, you know, there was the Exxon logo and it was colored red. You can, you can skin it to, to look like whatever you want it to look like. And it is 2D and 3D. On, uh, on mobile, what's the big difference? Well, indoor positioning, right? So you can see the blue dot if you have it enabled. Um, also, it's connected to your calendar, right? So the calendar that's native to that device, like iCal on, uh, on iOS or uh, Google Calendar on, on, or Samsung Calendar, depending on what Android you have, it's gonna read directly to that calendar. And insofar as your location in that event corresponds to a location that's recorded in your map, it'll just, it'll understands it and lets you drive to that inside of the indoors universe. Uh, and also has tracking capabilities that you can enable. Uh, so number one, you need to be able to see the blue dot. You control that by turning location services on or off. Number two, there's a setting inside the application where you can, uh, you can enable tracking. So the user uh, is able to turn that on and off. Uh, number three, the map maker needs to create a track zone in the map. If that's not there, you cannot track. Uh, number four, uh, somebody has to upload the device tracking feature service to Portal if you want to use the feature service version that you'd connect to GeoEvent, or they need to enable location tracking using the ArcGIS location tracking capability. All right, so um, it supports indoor positioning. Right now, uh, three vintages, right? Uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GPS. Um, there's a add-in, well, again, not technically an add-in. There's a bunch of geoprocessing tools for Pro that do what? It helps you batch process CAD into indoor maps. It helps you uh, uh, turn on the IPS signal. Uh, you get like an API key from the team in Vienna. You load that in and it creates a, a unique uh, identifier uh, so that you can see the blue dot inside of your applications. It also has a bunch of tools that create networks and there's a new thing at this incremental release that uh, loads uh, location data into service now. So that you'll see that in the release at 10, for 10.7.1. All right, so these are, uh, th this is not an extensive list, but it gives you an idea of the licenses that come with. So at 10.7.1, the web application is a configurable app template in Portal. At 10.7, you get this data folder that it's like an installation file on MyEsri. You download it, you install it. You copy the apps folder, the indoors app folder, into the apps fold folder in Portal. You do a couple things in the admin settings to share it to the configurable apps templates, and then it just shows up as a configurable app. Um, at this incremental release, we have real-time sharing of location for those that have opted into sharing. And then um, at the release on mobile in September, 
We'll have deeper integration with uh, work orders. Uh, so you can see them on the map with other si work orders coming from other systems like CityWorks and ServiceNow. Um, also uh, feature editing in, uh, in web uh, and mobile. Uh, the web part is kind of, it's later just because of the release cycle of, of enterprise. So that would be at the end of the year. And then we have, we have high ambitions. So give you an idea of what we're looking at. Okay, and I'm gonna hand this off to my colleague, uh, Morcott. Hello, okay. <clears throat> so uh, when we put together this application of ArcGIS Indoors, especially on mobile devices, we need to solve through a number of challenges. And one of the challenges is uh, to make the ArcGIS Indoor location aware, right? So we're looking at GPS, and a lot of people try the GPS inside in the buildings, but they won't work. They won't accurate enough to support our applications. So we turn around to the uh, IoT or Internet of Things to provide us a solution. So just for people who are not familiar with the Internet of Things, so IoT, it's the network of devices so the device embedded with technologies that can communicate and sense data. And we use that to help us providing indoor positioning systems. So if you look at the IoT, how we make this work, we divided that into components. So you see that on the left-hand side is so-called edge technologies that, do, uh, that deal with sensors and transmission from the source. And then we have the IoT platform in the middle that do all kind of orchestration, policy, ingestions, and analytics, whether it be real time or batch analytics. Also manage data that you can persist the data for further analysis in the future. On the right hand side, we have the enterprise that provides visualization and all the application, dashboarding and everything else. So we look at what we have. So we utilize our own component, RGS platform, to be an IoT platform. So you could see that we have the components available for real time like your events. We have account management, device management. We utilize portal and RGS server. <coughs> We have data store, which are big data store, like spatial temporal. We can deal with massive or high volume data storage and high frequency as well. We also have batch analytics component, like geoanalytics. Visualization and dashboard are also there. So we look at the technologies that will provide indoor positioning and we look at what we have in the office. So Wi-Fi access point technology is very potential. Also Bluetooth low energy or BLE technologies, beacons, provide us signals, radio signals that we can do some sort of translations. Once we have the indoor positions, then this open up the doors to integrate with other systems like ServiceNow or um, Pi, from OSI soft. We will talk about that later. So I'd like to hand this over to Bern to talk more about the indoor positioning system, how we bring about that to help access indoors. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, as everyone knows, this is how components look like. So Pat already uh, went into details about it. We've got the CAD and BIM integration. We've got the indoors pro add-in, indoors web, <laughs> indoors mobile, and so on. But I'm going to exclusively not talk about the actually the indoor positioning part. So this is really where my core expertise is, and this is where I'm coming from. I'm the IPS guy. So what is an indoor positioning? Why do we need this? Um, it, it, it is, thank you. <laughs> it's a system to locate objects and people inside of buildings. 
Uh, they can be either active or passive. And why you need this? Well, you got no accurate GPS position inside of a building, right? So you've got no, you get no signal on on your smartphone um, from the GPS, or the GPS is really inaccurate. So you need, we need to get something else. And most of the time, how we do this right now using Indarsh as Indoor's product is we either use Wi-Fi or, or BLE, as Pat already mentioned. But I would like to give you a quick overview about some other technologies um, that are out there and then get into detail about some of them. So uh, you can see here kind of a, a, um, an overview of technologies we've been looking at and we've uh, been working on integrating into our system, going from the right-hand side from a GSM to GPS to Wi-Fi to different um, sensor readings, also to BLE, 5G, an upcoming star um, going to light and going to um, UWB, ultra wideband. I'm not going to go in too much details now about this. Um, I, I had a session about it, but if you want to, we can talk about all of those different technologies then later. But basically how it looks like is that we've got BLE, um, we've got Wi-Fi and GPS. You might think, why GPS? Uh, why I already talked about GPS and GPS doesn't work inside a building? Well, but we need something between buildings. So if you look at, for instance, the ASRI campus, you've got multiple buildings and you don't want to equip the outdoors now with Wi-Fi or with beacons as well, so you can do some positioning. So we can automatically and seamlessly switch between those. And um, if I look, yeah, and then we've got the smart component like picking which type of um, IPS to use now. My old company, Indoors, is supporting the BLE part um, to this platform. Um, for the Wi-Fi part, we primarily work with Apple um, to deliver the best-in-class indoor positioning solution based on Wi-Fi. But if I look really into, this is product, how it works right now, but what's next? What are we, what are we really working on? And you already talked a little bit about it already is we really want to support all tier one IPS systems. So going from VLC, going from visual light communication to Wi-Fi to BLE to geomagnetic. And we really want to support their all tier one IPS systems out of the box. We do realize and recognize that uh, there might be some IPS systems that should be better. <laughs> that are very industry focused or have a very regional focus, but uh, some of our users, some of our partners really wants to use them. So there is the possibility of having a custom connector, of having a custom connection um, to uh, an IPS system that might be very strong in your regional market or in your, in your industry and we don't support it off the box. For those um, custom IPS connectors, please um, talk to the professional services team. They can help you setting this up. And before I hand over, I'd like to tell you a little bit also about, um, so the RGS Indoors is a geo-enabled system. It's a complete indoor mapping location system. We support IPS inside of it. But think about, think in the future also about this as a being, the IPS being a bigger play. We want to really um, enable not only RGS Indoors, but also other products like field apps uh, and others with the indoor positioning system, with the uh, floorware maps and and IPS. So this is one of our long-term goals and one of our long-term strategies. And you will probably see it next UC more about it. But um, so that just that you know, it's uh, it's going to be a real a platform play. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Marcot and Pat, who will show you what you can actually do with it. Okay, we'll try this again. <laughs> so. At our current release, uh, well, you, you, you won't see it on GitHub this week. It should be released in the coming weeks. Um, there is a, uh, an indoors Coop server integration with, server now, with ServiceNow. How many of you have heard of ServiceNow? OK, so a few of you. Awesome. So there, there's a couple ways that we're going to start thinking about IoT in this presentation. One is, oh, hey, we're putting all these devices up on walls, for example, and we're, we're connecting them together to create this positioning system. Oh, and by the way, now that I have this great position and uh, I'm turning these potentially into edge devices, which Morcott will go into, um, I can also start pulling in uh, event data coming in from other systems. So this is another. IoT pattern that we're seeing uh, in, the, in the indoors universe. 
So it's a complete integration solution for indoors with the ServiceNow application. It, number one, it provides tools to load location data into ServiceNow um, and expose incidents and events from ServiceNow uh, within ArcGIS indoors. So simply put, we, we take Coop, we add the special sauce attributes on top uh, that make it recognizable within ArcGIS indoors so that when I open up my, my, uh, my maps and my apps, I can just see those events and incidents and I can act on them, share them uh, with others and, actually, and hopefully uh, ameliorate it, take care of it uh, and make the workplace uh, a better workplace. Um, what does that look like? Well, number one, we need, we need location data, right? So we build our location data uh, and using ArcGIS indoors uh, with some uh, Python on top, um, we load locations into ServiceNow. And uh, so you'll see that in the toolbox uh, that's been released through ArcGIS indoors. And then you'll see the, uh, the code that we're gonna put out on the, uh, the Git site. So it's uh, github slash Esri slash indoors dash service now. So once it's out, that, that's where you would find it. And then uh, essentially it, it creates a feature service facade around that uh, data coming from this other system. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, this, if you've used ServiceNow, you see what that interface, you understand that interface and all we're highlighting here is that, look, you see that? This is us just dumping location data into ServiceNow. Now that that location data is in there, uh, either if it's a human created event or it's some automated event coming from, okay, coming from that system, um, it will show up inside of ArcGIS indoors. Uh, this is uh, what it would look like in the UI. Um, so I think this is, this is pretty hot. Um, we gave you kind of a, like a, con a configuration of the current version of indoors that we showed possibly the future uh, with the Exxon presentation at, during the plenary session. This is what the, uh, the actual new release would look like in September. So I, it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. So you'd be able to see all of that data in mobile and in web and act on it. And, and we're, you know, it's not just service now, we're looking at, you know, other, other systems in the same way. It's a pattern that we want to reuse. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to my colleague, Morcott. Without trying to blow up the sound. So we see uh, integration with other systems, but uh, this part we like to look at ArcGIS as an IoT platform specifically. So I presented you some diagram earlier, which is generic patterns, right? But now we want to be more specific with regarding ArcGIS indoors integrations. So we see that on the edge side, it's not just any sensor or any system but it's ArcGIS indoors in action on the edge, which is our mobile device, whether it be iOS or Android. And that working with the indoor positioning, so the system that Bern developed. So ArcGIS indoors on the device will be computing the uh, locations, getting some other data, and then sending that to our ArcGIS enterprise in the middle. So ArcGIS Enterprise will be managing policy, like what device can connect, who's the account that can log in and send data. So you are protected. We won't allow any rogue device or things like that. And we don't need any external device management to add on top of that. We have, in parallel to that, location tracking services coming out at uh, 10.7, so we utilize that location tracking. So the uh, data that's sent to the IoT platform can be coming from application like ArcGIS Indoors or Tracker. We share the same schema, so one way or another, this will come into the same special database. So that becomes the 
the the system that support that is the big data store, the orange block in uh, in the bottom. On the other hand, we have your event server that can work with location tracking. So any data that's coming into the uh, location tracking, your event can receive as well. And then you can add real-time processing. You can add geofencing. You can add attribute alert on top of that. The data in spatial temporal big data store, it will pile up over time at some point, depending on how many users in your organizations, it could end up to be many million records. So we need geoanalytics server to help you analyze that high volume data. On the right hand side, we have visualizations. So uh, I believe a lot of us already familiar with that dashboard and applications. So this is just a summary of what I just said, all the components that will be used to help you integrate with the IoT platform. In terms of data flow, this is summarized of data flow. So position data coming to the device, your phone, going into RKS Enterprise, location tracking, and then other components work on top of that and the backing store is spatial temporal. So this is nice because we don't have the problem with losing data because data will go into big data store first and persist that, right? So the chance of dropping the data is really rare. And also in terms of security, it enforced by portal security. So in this diagram, showing the uh, real-time analytics that GeoEvent will work with the location tracking. You can also add other data on top of that by sending data directly to GeoEvent and then persist it to special temporal big data. A little bit of animation here to show you all the layers, visualizations and feature services. So again, multiple device sending data to the platform. This is showing that you can do filtering in your event to do any geofence alerting or attribute alerting. You can also enrich data with your event, do any data mapping of schema if you want to transform it, and then sending it out to output. So example of geofencing, you can detect whether you're entering an area in the polygon, how long you stay inside of that, when did it, the device exit the geofence polygons. If you deal with polyline, you can also look at if it crossed the polyline, containment test and everything else. So I just add your analytics into the picture here because when, when we have a lot of data, typical geoprocessing tool may not be able to handle that amount of data. You need geoanalytics for that. Just keep in mind. So uh, another integration that I like to touch on is if we have SCADA system, system that monitor um, like electrical or water pressure, gas pressure, lighting, OSI SOP is the one system that partner with S3 and provide a Pi integrations. So they have Pi server that can manage those devices and read all the signals information. And I just wanted to point out, I think this one's working, kind of. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to give credit to is our partner Wolpert presented uh, on on some of this uh, in our special interest group session. And I thought it was like right on the money with what we wanted to talk about. And they graciously allowed us to, to show some of these. So this is a, 
This is essentially a, a visual pilot of something that they're planning on doing. And so they've already tested out pieces of it. It's not in production, but I encourage you to talk to them about you know, what their plans are. So. Right. So um, any of you familiar with Pi at all? OK, quiet numbers. So this is really big in utilities and oil and gas. Yeah. So it sends the situations of those sensors and then integrate with your event. So we can do detections and do data transformations in GIS, right? So um, Pi is a separate system, so you need to deal with all the installation configurations of the sensor, which one you want to send, and what group of sensor, what um, data value or data type that you want to send to your event. The challenge is Pi is not table-based, so they are hierarchical in nature, and the challenge is to transform the hierarchy of data into feature-like. So that's a lot of work, and, and as I saw, I've done maybe two or three years of development time to make this to work right? back in a couple of years ago. So once we have this, let's say Pi detecting some problem like water pressure too high or the lights out and someone need to go take care of it, that is when the information get back into RGS indoors. So the location of the problem will be reported and the in RGS indoor can help routing the technicians or anyone who need to take care of the problem to go to the right spot, right location, and hopefully in a timely ma manner as well, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so that's, that's why you see this kind of integration has become important increased efficiency in, in services and reporting. So Pi is an automated system as opposed to us or human reporting through a survey one, two, three, or three, one, one. Pi is a system that telling you what's wrong and where is it that you need to go and take care of it. Yeah. You have anything to add? No, I mean, that, that was just the interface where you make the connection between the thing in the map and the event or incident occurring in the, uh, or being recorded, picked up in the Pi system. Right. And then at this point, this is, uh, I guess if you go to slide 53, I'd wanted to show, you have that one? There you go. Yeah, this one. A couple. A couple? Okay. Yeah, so integrated indoors, uh, for example, you could easily configure the, uh, the explore function uh, to see new types of things. Again, those are completely configurable. There are some categories that we've pre-configured. You could totally get rid of them and make it, uh, you know, skin or uh, configured only for uh, these types of incidents. And we did something similar to that in the, uh, the plenary session with Exxon just to give you an idea of how configurable indoors was. So here uh, we put something in called assets and on the next slide you can say, well, maybe lights are an asset. And then using the integration with Pi, we could pull out all the incidences. For example, a light went out, and that's when you cue the, uh, the joke, how many indoors you know, product engineers does it take to screw in a light bulb, right? So then we can send out an email message to, to somebody on the team, and that could drive them directly to that location, update uh, the status, take care of it, and then you know, get out and go to the next ticket. Cool. I really like that, yeah, because in last okay. organization, there are a lot of report and service call and requests, and you have to manage those work orders and who can do what in a day. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we come to the uh, few case studies. The first one is about real-time device tracking. Um, so these real-world case studies. Um, so when we develop this, we we have to have some, something to give us to test and, and evolve the applications and the solutions. So we de uh, deploy a 1,000 plus Bluetooth 
This guy work hard. <laughs> Climb up the stair and then sticking all the <laughs> beacon around the campus, thousand of them. Imagine that. Um, each beacon has to be placed about 30 feet away, yeah, because that's the range of the radio signal, right? You don't want to, to miss anything. We also uh, use the uh, Apple technologies, Apple Wi Fi. We do a survey around the campus and upload the data to Apple, and Apple provide indoor locations. So this is, this is important for iOS device. Apple Wi-Fi doesn't work for Android, okay? And Android have to rely on Bluetooth for now until we have anything else, yeah? And we use our own S3 devices for testing. If Pat can talk about Exxon. Uh, sure. So on, in the Exxon uh, case, they're a, uh, they, they used Apple uh, Wi-Fi based positioning. They, they use iOS devices uh, in their organization. And so that's turned on for about four and a half million uh, square feet across their campus. And, and their pilot, uh, they have, I guess, 80 users uh, using the mobile applications uh, right now. Um, and so they're, in, you know, essentially in the middle of that, that uh, pilot test run. And then from there, they'll figure out in production how best they want to size the big data store, because they are collecting a lot, a lot of data. Uh, and then how they want to set up the, uh, the location sharing. And then, you know, you know they, need, they need the data set first to figure out how best they, they want to be able to analyze that data in terms of like what are appropriate analytics for the business cases that they want to solve with that information. Um, and so that's just a quick overview of, uh, of that one. So. so actually last year we also test deploy here with about 300 Bluetooth beacon and Wi-Fi. This year we deployed 350 plus Beacon. So Burns has been working here since <laughs> the weekend. Me not. You not. <laughs> okay, it's someone else in your team, yeah. right? So yeah, in the exhibit hall, you, if you notice, uh, on uh, I don't know if I have a picture. I can show that picture later. Yeah, that how how that installed. But let's look at the the data from our S3 campus. So this is a, an example of uh, using the location tracking service. So let me, uh, let me pull that up for you guys. And so I have a couple different, maybe we start from uh, the overview, right? So if you enable location tracking and uh, is this not on? Oh, hang on, hang on, I think it's just, uh, it's me. So if you enable uh, location tracking, uh, you do it in your organization. Uh, how many of you have actually seen this, this part of your portal and seen location tracking? A couple of you. So let me give you just eyes on so you can remember it. Uh, so if you had admin access to your portal, you'd go into settings, you'd go to lo location tracking. If it wasn't enabled, you'd see a button in it that says enable, and it would kick off a service. It's called the location tracking service. You need the BDS, the big spatial temporal big data store, to do it. If you don't have it, you can't do location tracking. Um, so once you turn it on, it creates a, uh, a service. Um, I'll find it for you so you can kind of see what it looks like on, on the portal. And then, We'll look in my org. We'll look for location. And there it is. So you see it's kind of, it's a funny little icon. It's got the little circle in it. And that means it's a, uh, you know, it's using that uh, type of spatiotemporal uh, data store. So it has two components to it in this, uh, in this layer. It has the tracks and a thing called last known location. And so uh, if you look at it, I don't have any data in this particular one, uh, but the last known is exactly what it said. So let's take a look at, uh, 
you know, some of the results. So here's just a snapshot of our team. And, um, you know, I picked a date range, a custom date range to look at this. And you can see that it's, it's literally connecting the dots, right? It's up to you to decide what you want to do with these dots, how you want to analyze it. You know, like you saw the demos in Pro where they do these hexagonal bins. Well, if you're managing space, you don't care about hexagonal bins, right? You care about spaces. So you're probably going to bin your results by spaces, right? I mean, that's just common sense. So in fact, the workplace map is the construct by which you would deconstruct this data or aggregate that data depending on the type of analysis you want to do. Um, so I don't, how many of you have seen the track viewer web app? All right, so just, just giving you an idea of what it, it looks kind of crazy indoors, right? So, so cause you can't really tell between floors. So this will be, you know, Evidence of success of indoors will be in a couple, maybe next year, hopefully, we'll see like a floor picker in here where we can kind of see through and it doesn't look like such a jumble. Um, but if I put it in ArcGIS Pro, right, so here I've created a portal item and pulled it into Pro and I've hooked it up to our range slider. So I just filtered it for Maricot and myself. And, and uh, so you can see here on the first floor, like, okay, we, uh, here's me getting ready for the plenary presentation. They locked me in this part of the building for what seemed like a month, and then occasionally they let me out to go eat in the cafe, right? And then, uh, you know, more, like Morricot works over here, so let, but not on the first floor, right? So, so you can see our, our foot traffic over here, and you can imagine if we were bending by rooms and buildings, we get a much more interesting picture of, oh, what's actually going on here? Like how much, how much dwell time do we spend in these different areas? What amenities are we actually using uh, in the Esri organization? Neither of us work on the third floor, so what is this? This is us just going up the staircase, basically, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. It's Thursday. <laughs> so, uh, and here we are on the third floor, right? So you can see all the, the traffic. And you'll, I mean, look at that, right? I mean, that's pretty good uh, detail, pretty good, uh, you know, resolution on, you know, where, where, you know, where the points are. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot you can do with this information. We're, we're just scratching the surface in this, in this particular uh, presentation right now. And, uh, you know, like for example, at Exxon, and it is 3D information, right? So at Exxon, like at our campus, that was an example of Bluetooth generated positioning. And, and this is an example of the Wi-Fi generated positioning. And, and uh, that's not bad. That's not bad. I mean, you can probably use it for, you know, some higher level business ops use cases, not just wayfinding. And so, you know, things that they're trying to do at Exxon, for example, they call it uh, uh, sociophysics, right? So it's the interaction of a team, uh, like team dynamics in the, in the built environment, right? So how should the built environment be best constructed to support optimal team dynamics? So that, that's their challenge, and they're fully vested in it. So it's pretty exciting. And so I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Morikon. All right. So this is an example for S3 campus. And you could see that we could separate between different users, green and red, and also the, the elevation as well, what floor they actually at. Actually, I have a, a live feed running as well, if I can bring it up. Let's see. Actually, not this one. Yeah, OK, that's the one. So you can see that. Um, so I can identify on this, and it will bring up attribute data. See the activities. We also capture activities. So this one, I'm driving around the campus just to test, 
right? And you see the, the automot automotive mode. And who, who uh, send the edit, or I mean send this data in, right? The name of the user. And if I click on something else here, it say walking. I hope you can see that. It say walking. Um, also, we have in the data we have the uh, the tracking zone, and S3 campus is sort of oh, yeah. spread out quite a bit. And you could see that if I drive away from the campus, then it stopped tracking. See, on this road, as, as soon as I drive out of the gate somewhere here, on the road there's no track. <laughs> then we have another location of our warehouse over here, and then I, I turn into the warehouse area, and then it starts tracking again. So, so we ensure the privacy, right? You are off the work, working zone, and we don't track you back to your home. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's a lot of concern about privacy and the real-time tracking of device. I, we understand that, so we, we add that feature. Okay, let me get back to my slide again. Yeah, this is just a screenshot of what I did show you. And here where we deploy beacons, if you look up and you walk in the exhibit hall, you can spot those beacons. And if you come by our booth at the indoors kiosk, we have a, uh, an Android device set up where you can take a look at the result. Right. And try to notice if we space them out of about 30 feet, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did walk around and I, I, I noticed those, yeah. And uh, the beacon will last for, and the battery will last for like four three years, years, three years, three okay. Years. Yeah. And the accuracy of the beacons is two to three meters, two to three meters mm -hmm. right? As opposed to the, uh, the indoor position from Wi-Fi, that could be 10 meters. So beacon is more accurate. If you want really accurate location, beacon might be the one that you pick. And when we have indoor position, then we can, we can do a lot of other things. You see that we have a dashboard that detect uh, with the geofence alert. So who entering that area, how long they spend time inside of that area, and when you exit. And then um, heat maps. It's a good visualization showing that, you know, the staircase is used the most in this case. <laughs> People go up that staircase all the time. So that's where the heat map showing. And uh, you see uh, the one, the, over here in the lower part, that's where I'm doing my development work. So that's why I showed my track concentration over there. That data, to get to that level of analytics, you need to have data store in the big data store first, and then you can bring back, you can play back just like Pat did. Separate data by floor, by time, by any attribute combination in the query, and then you can produce visualization to, to show the result. So the takeaway point for today, so we build access indoors that provide awareness about locations, workplace near me, nearby. We also make it aware of facility or buildings and floor. So we need to understand that floor and altitude or Z are different things. Z and altitude, you know, hardly understood by us to associate with floor, right? And to make the device recognize what floor we are at or what building we are in. So we added that. We also added where to handle information like people, time, schedule, walk time, events. We respect privacy settings. 
So you can turn it on and off if you want it to be, uh, the device to be tracked or not. You can, we can track in the zone or outside the zone. When, integ when integrated with IoT, the edge integration gives us accurate indoor positioning systems, more accurate than GPS can provide. BLE added more accuracy if you want to get that kind of accuracy. The platform solution also gives us a lot of capabilities in terms of managing devices policy account. We do data store persistency analytics. We do 2D and 3D visualizations. Real-time location sharing also enable with the backend integrations. Without the backend, you can't do that because the data will go to the central storage and then pull it back, right? So that's important. Tracking of people and asset in the workplace is the same. You need to do that kind of integration to enable this. Also, the analytics for geofence and attribute alert. This is not yet done on edge device. In the future, we might add that. But at this time, you need the backend to support it. So uh, that pretty much we have. Oh, I forgot the integration with external system. This is really important too. This is open up the door for a lot more application that you can imagine. Work order management, incident reporting, say under three, they're all possible. Yeah, but you need to work on these integrations. So we're going to open up for questions. Are there any questions? We have about five minutes. Questions. Whoa. <laughs> Why is it so loud? Um, yes, right here in the middle. Yep. So the question is, are we planning on other further integrations with maintenance management systems? Yes. So that's a top priority uh, for indoors is uh, making it easy to link to these other business operations systems. Uh, Maximo is on the list. Yes. Uh, you know, things like Arcabus, Tririga, uh, CityWorks is already, I mean, that's, that's in process. ServiceNow is in process. In the airport's context, you know, we're looking at things like FlightAware and, and, you know, other integration points like that. There was a couple hands raised. Yes, ma'am, in the back corner. It, yeah, so we've had, uh, yeah, so is there uh, application for indoors in retail? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, there's always going to be a case for uh, what we'd call the business to business uh, use case, or like that organization, let's pick on Target, for example, I'm just making this up, that they, uh, they want to use it to help, you know, optimize different business functions like store security, for example, or, or maintenance management. Uh, but you could imagine that they'd also potentially want to provide something for the, the like facing the consumer. Um, so that, that's something that we've heard, and there's no reason that you couldn't do that uh, with, with indoors. I kind of answered your question. But, but, the, but the primary thrust is the business-to-business -business, uh, use cases. Yes? No, but if uh, you want to help us get started with Princess Cruises, that would be cool. That, I'm wondering what coordinate system we'd use. So no. <laughs> so, no, no, we're not. But that's interesting. I'll, I'll have to take a look at it. We, we, can, we can talk. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Basically, Morikot said that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Other questions? I saw some other hands. Don't be shy. We have a few more minutes. Yes, sir.
Uh, I'll partially answer that, and then it sounds like more, more up Morikot's alley. We, you know, we're looking at working with uh, other partners uh, that that essentially already have a bunch of off-the-shelf connectors to systems like that. So you can see events coming in, and and the challenge or what you'll see, for example, is like if you looked at like Cisco's IoT platform, they'll have all these off-the-shelf connectors. And not only can you see things, but you can do things. Uh, so typically the underlying technology is like, you'll have this kind of visual programming interface, and I don't know, it's been described to me as ladder logic. It's kind of like FME, if you've ever used FME. So I'm gonna grab an input, right? And I'm gonna like go, this thing connects to a space, and it's connected by the space ID field, right? And so you'll begin to see all this stuff connected to that space, and then once you do that, you're able to do other kinds of things. You'll like because you're pulling in the information from that other system, and maybe that other system allows you to actuate something real, like close the gate, you know, shut off the valve, for example. Uh, so I'm excited about that. It just hasn't happened yet. Actually, the the back end support that we used to have the IoT session that demonstrate actuation, right? That uh, we do geofence detections and then. Um, we actuate uh, the PA announcement that say welcome, <laughs> uh, Pat, you know, something like that. Or if you walk by close to a uh, high um, voltage, you know, that could be, could be dangerous and it, it call out like, be careful, you are too close <laughs> to that, yeah. So actuation is, is possible, you even can, can send that back and uh, the IoT session might be the one that you want to look into and in, into more detail how we accomplish that and all the connector available that can send out command to execute program or to you know send command to to rotate the uh, camera or things like that is all possible. Yeah. So one more, we have time for one more question. Who will have the last question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. No, it's 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 inside it. I'll let uh, RFID tags. RFID. Oh. <laughs> RFID tags. Yeah. So we use various technologies in order to determine one's position. Um, we have not uh, worked in a fully, I would say, production environment with a mass scale of RFID I think tracking. She's talking more about asset tracking. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's yeah, right. Okay. That's one. Yeah, so uh, we are more experienced on the BLE, on the blue flow energy side, uh, like tracking high security equipment in a hospital. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so as I used to work in the UN team, we went into this use case quite a bit. So RFID tags works, you know, in a reverse way of device, right? Because device, we, we have the beacons, and the device, we do triangulations. And device is active, right? IFID, on the other hand, is a moving, just like moving beacons in a way. So you need to press your readers in the corridor, in the gateway, things like that to, to detect which IFID tax is passing nearby. And it then can determine the locations. Um, in oil and gas, um, they are IFID tag that used on the batch, which has high power uh, transmissions and also have like panic buttons thing, and things like that. So with the IFID readers that you place, strategically place on, you know, in, indoors, then the reader can send information to your event and to other application as well. So that's how it works, yeah. And I'll, I'll just add on real quick. I mean, so there could be existing uh, protocols created for GeoVent, for example, for RFID uh, for different brands. The critical thing, right, would be to add the half a dozen special attributes that indoors wants to see, right? And if you did that, then it just works with the system, right? You could wire it up to the explore function, for example, and then, then theoretically you could share that location with others. And I mean, I, I would imagine these are the things that you'd want to do. So the, the only thing that's different with indoors than, than in the previous world, with just 
ArcGIS Outdoors technology, um, <laughs> would have been that now I can add the extra attributes and I can see it inside of a building, right? And I guess we're out of time, so let me, can you put it on the next slide? So do us a favor, I know a bunch of people already left, but go uh, tell us what you thought of the, the session and tell us uh, how we can be better or say, man, they were so awesome, there's no way they could be better. So wh whatever your choice. So thank you. I appreciate your time.